So, we have been looking at means to escape local optima when we are doing local search and we looked at a couple of deterministic methods. We saw uh, uh, that beam search was one approach or the variable neighborhood descent was another approach and taboo search was the third approach that we saw. But very often in practice people use uh, randomized methods or stochastic methods. So, let us look at some of them uh, now. So, this is just a recap as to why are we interested in local search because the search spaces are too huge and we saw that uh, once n becomes let us say more than 50 or something then the size of the search space becomes too huge to be explored completely and therefore, we are want to use some kind of a approach to move towards the solution, but in a local fashion essentially. So, we had seen this essentially. So, let me uh, kind of uh, uh, again discuss this problem that uh, we have been using quite a bit uh, and that is a SAT problem essentially. So, what is a SAT problem? Uh, basically, SAT is short for satisfiable and we are talking about Boolean formulas or propositional formulas or propositional logic where we have statements like P, Q, R, S, T or Boolean formulas where you may have variables a, B, C, D, E or X, Y, Z and so on and so forth. We are looking at a particular form of this formula which is called the conjunctive normal form. It is common practice to do this. Uh, we can convert any proportional formula or Boolean formula into uh, a CNF formula, which is a conjunctive normal form. What is the conjunctive normal form? Is that the main connective in this formula is an AND. So, you can see that these sub formulas are connected using the AND. This AND is a logical AND and how does this work? That if you have two formulas, F1 and F2, then the combined formula F1 and F2 is true only when both F1 is true and F2 is true. That is the meaning of the AND. Each of these formulas connected by the AND is called a clause. So, this is a clause. As you can see in this formula, there are six clauses uh, uh, connected with five AND connectives. What is the semantics of this formula in the CNF form is that every clause must be satisfied. What do we mean by satisfied? By satisfied we mean that the every clause must evaluate to true. So, we have already said that when does the formula F1 and F2 evaluate to true? when both F1 and F2 evaluate to true. So, recursively now we can look at any one of these clauses. When will this formula evaluate to true? So, we are talking about valuations here. You can see that in this formula there are uh, six variables A, B, C, D, E and F essentially. And when we say a variable, we basically mean it can take a value which is either true or false essentially. So, these have values either true, false or more commonly we write it as 1, 0. So, 1 stands for true and 0 stands for false essentially. So, basically the task is to look for a valuation for these 6 variables such that the each of the clauses becomes true and when does each clause become true? So, first of course, we have the negation uh, logical connective. Uh, the semantics of negation is as follows that if, uh, if d is equal to 0, then negation of d equal to 1 and vice versa. So, negation basically flips the truth value of its constituent. So, wherever it is applied, so if d was 0, 
if we had chosen a valuation of d equal to 0, then not d would be 1 essentially of this thing. So, that is negation. So, we have already seen, we have seen and, uh, then we have seen negation. The third thing that we need to see is the or essentially. So, this is the or part and the semantics of or is that if in our representation, let us say f 1 or f 2 or f 3, let us say this is a decision, this, this is a clause made up of three constituents. This clause will be true if any one of f 1, f 2, f 3 is true. If all of them are true also, it will be true, but in, at least one should be true. So, you can see that to satisfy this Boolean formula, which has got six clauses, uh, as we can see here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. We have to make each of these clauses true. And to make each of the clauses true, at least one of the constituents must be true. And how do we search this space? What is, how do we represent this space? We use a binary uh, string of 1s and zeros to represent the candidate solution essentially. So, for example, uh, let us say this is one binary string made up of 6 1s. What does this say? This says that uh, a is equal to 1, b is equal to 1, c is equal to 1, d is equal to 1, e is equal to 1 and f equal to 1. Then we kind of plug in these values. So, for example, if you look at this candidate, all 1s essentially, what happens to our formula? You can see that because a is in the first clause, so the first clause has become true. You can see that b is in the second clause and because of that b second clause becomes true. You can see that d is in the third clause and therefore, we said that the semantics of disjunction is that any one has to be true. Because d is true, then that clause becomes true. If you look at the fourth one, that also has d, so fourth clause is also true. If you look at the fifth one, that also has d, so that clause becomes true. And if you look at the sixth one, that has a, then this clause becomes true. So, it so turns out that this starting point that I have chosen makes the formula true or satisfiable. So, when we say the formula is true, then we are saying satisfiable. But if we had chosen some different uh, this thing, so we could have chosen for example, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 and that uh, would have a different effect on the formula. And we do not know whether this formula would satisfy the uh, this this valuation would satisfy the given formula or not and I will leave this as a small exercise for you. So, all these are candidates. What do we mean by saying that the space the space is large is that what are the different ways that you can choose a valuation function. So, 1 1 1 1 1 is 1 1 0 0 1 0 1 is another and so on and so forth. So, you can see that uh, each bit can be selected in two ways and if there are n bits, then they have two raised to n ways. So, the number of possible candidates is two raised to n that, that is what we meant when we said that uh, uh, the sad problem, the space is a size two raised to n essentially. And of course, we had ob observed that uh, TSP is much harder. But SAT has been of interest in many places and we should do a little bit of refinement on the complexity of SAT. Uh, so, this is a uh, subclass of SAT which is called 2 SAT and by 2 SAT we mean that each clause has at most 2 literals. So, you can see that within the brackets every clause has exactly two literals in this example, but it could have one also. For example, I could have had a, another clause which said not of d and that also would be a two set formula. Now, it has been shown that uh, solving two set is easy and it is can be solved in p. So, when we talk about complexity, we mean polynomial time. And in, in as computer scientists, we are in general happy with 
problems which can be solved in polynomial time. So, 2 set can be solved in polynomial time, but just add one more literal to every clause. So, now we say at most 3 literals. So, you can see that these examples all of them have 3 literals, but I could have again added something like A or B and let us say not B or something and that would still be a 3 set formula. And Gary and Johnson in their classic work in the very early 80s had shown that this belongs to the set of complexity class called NP complete and by this we mean that it takes non-deterministic polynomial time essentially. I am sure you must have studied the uh, complexity at some point. And so, when you say it is a non-deterministic polynomial time, it means that if we somehow had a magical oracle which could tell us as to what valuation to select, then we could solve it in polynomial time, but otherwise it will take exponential time. So, in general when we talk about this, it means exponential time. And which is why SAT is considered to be, in fact, it is a classic example where if you can reduce any formula to, uh, to SAT or 3 SAT, then we know that it belongs to the NP complete set and there is a whole set of formulas which are called the NP complete set. K SAT, if K is greater than 3, the complexity could be much higher. Now, experimentally people have found that the probability of 3 SAT being satisfied is varies like this. Uh, uh, this green curve that I have drawn essentially. Okay. What are the parameters here? There are two parameters. One is m which is the number of clauses in the formula. So, remember that every SAT problem has a number of clauses. So, m is the number of clauses and what is n? n is the number of variables essentially. So, see we saw in the small example that we chose 6 variables, but you could have any number essentially. And the probability of 3 SAT being satisfiable is very high when this ratio of m is to n is less than 4 or less than 4.3 and somehow at 4.3 there is a point where there is a sudden drop in the probability and uh, it may not have a solution at all essentially as the number of clauses keeps increasing. So, remember that as the number of clauses increases we are moving in this direction as m by n becomes larger. So, and remember that every clause has to be made true for, for the formula to be satisfiable. So, as the number of clauses keep increasing, the probability of a randomly chosen SAT formula becomes less and less of being true. And uh, so, that is also around the time when the complexity of deterministic method peaks, because before that you can solve them, you can solve the SAT uh, in reasonable time and then just around 4.3, it takes a lot of time. And after 4.3, because you discover sort of quite early that it cannot be solved, so the complexity becomes lower again. This is just a recap of uh, uh, the taboo search method that we had studied in which we took this formula of 6 uh, uh, clauses and 4 variables. So, that is why every uh, candidate has got 4 bits 1010 or 1001 and so on. And we had seen that how taboo search could find uh, a path even from a local maxima to a uh, global maximum. Then we had uh, mentioned uh, uh, the fact that what is the sanctity of starting from one particular point, especially in this solution space search problems, uh, where you are interested only in a goal load which satisfies a certain property. Uh, the fact that we started with something is of no importance essentially. And we saw that on this small problem, the blue nodes are the ones from where if you started, hill climbing would reach a solution essentially. So, you can see that if you were to let us say start from this node, then from this node you could go to this node which is a solution. So, like likewise for every blue node you can reach a solution from there. Of course, you cannot reach a solution from the local maximum because by definition that is what we mean by the local maximum. So, the question that we asked was why not choose different starting points essentially and that is where we had left it earlier. This is a again the beam search example that we had seen. We said that we chose one starting point which is 5 ones here 
and then we found that with a beam width of 2, uh, after 2 rounds uh, it reached local maxima and uh, then in the third round it could not reach a heuristic value of 6. Uh, remember that the heuristic function was number of clauses satisfied and since there are 6 clauses, the solution will have all 6 satisfied. And we had also observed that if you had started from this place instead of 1, 1, 1, 1, you would have reached the solution in this thing. So, iterated hill climbing essentially says just try many different start nodes randomly and that is the first flavor of randomness that we have in introduced into our this thing. <coughs> so, this is the algorithm iterated hill climbing. Uh, you first choose a ran random candidate and say that that is the best we have found so far and then some choose some number n and repeat this whole thing n time that do hill climbing starting with a new random candidate in every iteration. And we hope that in one of those n cycles, it will find uh, the solution. And we saw with this small graph that we draw for a small sad problem, that the chances increase as we start with different starting points. <coughs> and so again, this is repeating the same this thing. And if we had started from any of these uh, blue nodes, we would have reached the global maxima. Of course, if we had started with the global maxima, we would have stayed there itself. So, there is a good chance that you would find the, this thing. So, this just kind of shows the footprint of, uh, we can try to visualize what is the advantage of hill climbing. So, if this is the function that we are trying to optimize or find the maximum value of and on the x axis are the uh, candidate solutions, then you can see that because iterated hill climbing is basically doing a series of hill climbings. If you were to start with any of these shaded nodes here, supposing you were to start here, then steepest gradient ascent would take you to the, to the maximum. If you would have started from here, again you would have gone to the maximum. But if you had started outside this zone, then you would not have reached the maximum. So, this is in some sense the footprint of uh, iterated uh, hill climbing algorithm and really you can see that it depends on the nature of the surface that uh, the chances of success are there, are there essentially. So, next we will uh, move on to stochastic actions or randomized actions essentially. So, in so far in our algorithms, uh, we always do the move generation and deterministically make a move on that. Now, we will do this probabilistically and so the question we will ask is to move or not to move from a given node to the next node. So, we will take this up in the next session. <coughs>